Hi, I'm Noam Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Not long ago, we paid a visit to one of the treasure houses of American furniture, the Winter Tour Museum. It's in the heart of the Brandywine Valley in Delaware. Among the treasures that we saw was a collection of Pennsylvania Dutch furniture where we found a dower chest. It would be a piece that would be built for a woman in which she would store her dowry. We'll take you there next to look at the antique and then we'll come back here and show you how to build and paint our version of a dower chest. That's next right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Funding is provided by... It may not look like a power tool, but Minwax rich wood stains and clear protective finishes are made to give you the power to turn a house into a beautiful home. Minwax, making wood beautiful for 100 years. Forest Products, makers of hardwood plywood, veneer, and flooring, celebrates those of you who would rather be in the workshop than anywhere else. Today we're in the beautiful Brandywine Valley, halfway between New York City and Washington, D.C. We're at the masterpiece of Henry Francis DuPont, Winterthur. Now, he inherited the house in 1926, which is actually a very small part of what we see today. Inside, there are 175 period rooms filled with 85,000 objects, furniture, textiles, ceramics, and everything in between. We're going to get a tour from the Director of Conservation, Greg Landry. It's beautiful inside. Norm, welcome to the Port Royal Parlor, one of Henry Francis DuPont's very favorite rooms. Wow, I can see why. This is a great space. It is exquisite. It, the architecture here comes from a house in Frankfort, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. built about 1762. If you look at the crown molding, the overmantel, it's all period and from that time. How about the furniture? Where did that come from? The furniture also is a Philadelphia region dating about 1760, 1770. It's the very first order. This is a tilt-top tea table, single-board mahogany top. And this over here is a what's called a slab-top table, and the carving is uh, very much the order that you'd find in Chippendale shops in Philadelphia. All right, so what pieces are your favorites? Well, I have two that I really like a lot in this particular room. This is one, the, the um, fan pelt high chests with plum pudding mahogany here. The carving is of the very best of that time period. It's an exquisite object, it's diminutive, it's not as big as some other pieces, so it has more of a personal stance to mm -hmm. it. And how long, how many people would it take to build a piece like this? It's hard to say. A, a piece like this requires a variety of craftsmen, maybe three or four, over a period of a month or two to make this. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now tell me about these sofas in the middle of the room. Well, the sofas are of interest both from perspective of great craftsmanship the time period, the carving on the legs and so on, but they also have a history of being owned by the John Dickinson family. John Dickinson being author and statesman of the revolutionary period. You know, they appear to me to be a bit stiff and hard. Did Mr. DuPont want his guests to only stay a short time? <laughs> no, it's, it was in his taste as the poultry was done, and that's how you see them now. In a time, they probably would have had bolsters behind, be more comfortable people ah. to sit in. Now another one of those beautiful tall chests here. This is. This is the Graz high chest, also about 1770. The striped mahogany that you see here, the carving again is of the very best Philadelphia craftsmanship. Now these brasses are a bit more ornate. They are. They're uh, chinoiserie influenced brasses, uh, oriental in design, original to the object, and the very first order for um, brass workmanship. Hmm. You think we could take a look at one of the drock for construction? I want to sure. see how that looks. Take a look inside here. The drawer front, of course, is mahogany, uh -huh. and the drawer side, secondary wood, this is tulip. And all dovetailed together. Beautifully dovetailed. Uh, the interior is white cedar. Mm. Classic Philadelphia drawer construction. Nice construction. 
Now, how rare is a piece like this? This is rare. It is unique. You're not going to find another piece like this uh, anywhere. It stands alone as a singular object. Well, it's nice of you to show it to us. Certainly. Well, Norm, now we're in the Kirshner parlor. It's a room that dates about 1755. The architecture comes from a home up in Brooks County, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. The furnishings in here are Pennsylvania German in context. So we have a heavy chair covered in what looks like leather. These are Moravian chairs, that's right. Mm -hmm. A simple pencil post bed in this corner. And what is this tall piece over here? Well, this is a grand trunk or what we call today a wardrobe. It dates from 1768, uh, made for the Herr family. They would keep their family linens, clothing, that sort of thing here. It's pretty it's impressive piece. piece. <laughs> yes. Now this is what we're looking for, a nicely painted chest. Yeah. What can you tell me about this piece? Well, so it's a fun piece. The, it's dated 1805, made for a woman named Elizabeth. Uh, why would this have been made for her? Likely it was made in anticipation of her marriage, a, a place to store linens, uh, all those sorts of things that she need in her household. Mm -hmm. It's a good size, elevated off the floor. Bracket feet, yeah. Some drawers for storage. What's the inside look like? The interior has got a lot of going for it. It's an interesting construction in here. This is what's called a till. What was that for? Used to store small things, small linens, candles, anything for easy access to be here. Look at the quality of this wood. Single board lid. You can see the hand plane marks on it. Single board down the back and nice and thick. And as I would expect, the corners are joined together with through dovetails. I can just barely make them out through the paint. That's right, and the dovetailing actually is a little different, very much in the Germanic tradition. It's called wedge dovetailing, and this is a model of that very joint there. And you notice in this pin, there is a slot, a mm -hmm. saw curve there. Uh, the wedge is put into that saw curve, pounded home, trimmed off, and it gives you an exceptionally strong joint ready for paint. Wow, I've never seen anything like that before. It's good German workmanship. Now, tell me about the paint. Is there anything special about the paint or the actual decoration itself? There are a number of things. It's very much typical of a variety of, of um, Germanic objects, not just furniture. You'll notice the symmetry of the design, the use of tulip or tulip-like uh, flowers. It's just a fun sort of imagery that they use to create on a chest like this. Mm. Well, I think this is going to give us plenty of inspiration to go back to the New Yankee Workshop and build a chest of our own. I wish you well with it. Now, uh, I'd like to see the rest of the museum. Any tips? Uh, yes, he has some time, maybe a week or two, wow. and perhaps some good walking shoes. You should be in good order. All right. Well, I think I should get started. Thanks right. for the tour. Thanks so much, Norm. Well, Greg was right. You really do need two weeks to fully explore winter tour, and I only had a day. Now, I did find some treasures, so I'll have to go back. When it came time to build our painted dower chest, I scaled it way down. This is about two-thirds the size of the antique that we saw. It has a hinged lid, and I built a little box that they said was used for storing candles to act as a support. It's made out of poplar because we're going to paint it. And down at the bottom, these are false drawer fronts. We felt that real drawers wouldn't work very well. They're just too low. The chest is elevated off the floor, supported on this base, and the corners are all nicely through dovetailed. If you'd like to build your own version of a painted dower chest, a measure drawing is available, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, the material that I'm going to use is poplar that was sent to us by a friend of the show, Charlie Tutton. He sent us a bunch of this rough stock a few years ago, and we've been using it on special projects. Now, rough stock has to be dressed before you can build any furniture. And it's often cupped and sometimes twisted. So to flatten out one surface, I run it through my jointer. Before we use any power tools, however, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Two or three passes through should take care of it. Now I'm going to turn to my surface planer. I'll take that freshly jointed surface, put it on the bed of the planer, and the cutter head will true this side and bring it to the dimension that I want. 
Once I have my boards surfaced, I can then think about gluing up panels. And whenever I glue up panels, I like to look at the end grain of the piece. So if you look at this first piece, the grain is going up. And the next one, it's going down, up and down. And what this does is it helps average any cupping over the entire piece. Now, when I slide these together, these joints look pretty good, but they're not good enough. We'll treat those at the joiner. To reinforce the joint between the boards, a slot for number 20 biscuits. Okay, with the biscuits in place, just join the pieces together. I need six panels, five more to go, all made the same way. Now I'm ready to cut my panels to length, and I'm going to use my homemade panel cutter has a stop on it here against which I place the panel and when I trim it I'll get a nice square end. With the panel sized I'm now ready to work on the joints at the corners and we're using through dovetail joints. Here's a sample. This is the tail board. I have three tails in this piece. The slots left behind receive the pins from the pin board. The front and back will have the tails, the ends will have the pins. Now I'm going to cut the tails first, so I've mounted the back panel in this dovetailing jig. I've set the spacing of the fingers for the layout that I want, and by following the jig with this router and collar with the dovetail bit, by going into each of these slots, I'll form a tail. Now I can remove it from the clamp, Keep it in the same face orientation, flip it end for end, clamp it down, and route the tails on the other end. With the tail boards complete, I'm ready to work on the pin boards. So I flipped the jig over, and now these pointed fingers face out. I made a sample to get the pin size just right, and that's all set. I've switched the router by removing the dovetail bit and installing this straight cutting bit. I route out the material between the fingers on the jig and that'll form the pins. Well now I need a groove at the bottom edge of each panel to receive the bottom of the chest. And on the long pieces I have to stop that groove, otherwise it's going to show through on this tail piece when I do the assembly. I'm just using my router with a half inch straight cutting bit and a guide fence. Now on the short panels I can run the groove all the way through. The bottom of the chest is 7 eighths of an inch thick, so I need to reduce the thickness to a half inch to fit into that groove that I just machined. I'm simply using the stacked dado with the sacrificial fence. Right, now the idea is to dry fit everything together to make sure it fits properly. Once we put the glue on, there's going to be no turning back. All right, that'll do it for tonight. Now tomorrow we'll start in by building this little box with the lid on the interior. Then we'll be able to glue up the whole case, make the base, the moldings, the draw fronts, and the lid. I think we'll make it. Well, good morning. I'm still in the dry fitting stage, and I've cut the pieces for the internal box and I'm now laying out for some biscuits to attach it to the sides. I don't want any mechanical fasteners to show. I've also laid out for some holes, which will be for the dowels on which that lid will pivot. Now I can take it apart and cut all the biscuit slots. And when I put it together, I have to do it in sequence. Now there's a 9 16 inch diameter hole for the dowel pin from the lid. Using my doweling jig, I can make a half inch hole for the pivot pin that's going to go in the lid. 
and that takes care of the finger hole in the lid. I'm applying a thin coat of glue to all the mating surfaces of this through dovetail joint. And you can see how many mating surfaces there are. And with the shape of this joint and the way it interlocks, it's extremely strong. And that makes you understand why it's a preferred joint of woodworkers. I don't have a lot of time to work with this piece, however. So, let's see if we can get this side on and clamp it up. Now the glue has set enough on the assembly that we've done so far, so I've removed the clamps in order to install the other side. So with all the glue on the joint, I can just, first I want to just engage the joint, just get it started on each end. Okay, now the lid has to go in at this point, and I've glued in dolls in the holes that I drilled earlier. And I'm going to slip it in the hole, and then as I drive that top home, I'll engage the other dowel. All right, it started. All right, now we can clamp it up. While that glue cures, let's start working on the base that elevates the chest above the floor. It's actually made up of two pieces. There's a lower piece with a slight detail here and a rabbit on the inside that the chest sits on. And then there's a little scotia that sits on top of that. I want to start by cutting this detail at the router station. For that rabbit on which the chest sits, I'm simply using the stack dado and the sacrificial fence. Now I'm beginning to form that cove molding that sits on top of the piece I just made. A piece of 3 8 inch stock, I'll cut a cove on each edge, and then I'll rip the pieces out at the table saw. When I machined the dovetails, I made them long, deliberately. Now I want to sand them flush before I fit the base. Now I'm ready to cut out those pieces of base. I made a template out of poster board to lay out the design. And I'm going to rough it out using my jigsaw. And I'm going to stay about an eighth of an inch away from this straight line. Here, I've mitered the corners on the base piece, and now I'm going to apply this piece of three-quarter by three-quarter stock flush with this rabbit. And that will give me more support and glue area to attach the base. Just using a scrap as a guide to make sure it's even. Now that cleat not only adds support, but it acts as a guide for this flush trimming bit to smooth up the bottom of the cut. The only section I'll have to do by hand is right in this corner. Okay, a good bead of glue where this base is going to meet the chest, and I'll secure it with some one and a half inch brads. Now this little block is a support piece which will add support to the side of the base at the back of the chest. And I'm going to join it to the chest with some biscuits. All right, now with the biscuit installed at that miter joint and glue, I can slip the pieces together and nail them to the bottom of the chest. All right, now that corner block, I put glue and a biscuit, and that slides in like this. And then I'm going to take a little piece and glue it in this corner as a glue block to secure it to the base. Now what that'll do is add a lot of support right along this piece, otherwise this could break off. And now it's time for that little scotia or cove molding that I made earlier. Put some glue on it, 
set it in place, and secure it with some pin nails. Using a bit from a window sash making kit, I've just machined an edge on this piece. I'm going to rip a molding out of that. Now that molding is going to be a band that defines the drawer area from the rest of the chest. All right, now this cleat is going to support the lid on the interior box when it's closed. A little bit of glue and a couple spring clamps while it sets. Well, now I'm starting to work on the lid. And the first thing I want to do is make a groove a half inch deep on the front and the ends. And I'm using a slot cutting bit. I'll do it from this face, then I'll flip it over and do it on the other side. That'll center this groove, which will receive a decorative edge. The front piece of trim, I can glue the entire length because the grain of the trim piece and the grain of the top run in the same direction. I've dry fitted the end pieces and because of a cross grain with the top going this way and the trim going this way, I will glue the front six inches because I want to keep this miter tight. But the remainder will be unglued and I'll secure it with some dowels that I'm going to place in these holes that I'm drilling. And we trim it flush. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the draw fronts are false fronts. I start out with some 5 16 inch stock and I've rounded the edges to create the illusion. I'm going to tack these false fronts on with some hot glue because the painting procedure may require that they be removed. And now I'm starting to form that decorative edge on our lid. I have the face side down and I've put this piece of quarter inch hardboard here to give me a little extra support for the router base so it won't rock and I'm just using a half inch cove bit. Now with a half inch bit I'm able to complete the profile on the edge. All right, that completes the woodworking. A little final sanding, and this will be ready for painting. Well, here it is, our completed dower chest. To do the finish, we tried to imagine what this chest might have looked like when it was freshly painted. And we started by putting down an oil primer as a base, sort of an off-white color like this. Then we brought in a friend of the show, John Coles, who's a decorative artist. He made up some stencils, taking inspiration from the antique original, and then he mixed up some vinegar paint, basically pigment and vinegar. He would put it on, and before it dried, he would take, in this case, a piece of clay and create these little features. In these corners, he would take a piece of cardboard and do that, and of course, hand paint in these with the stencil. I tried it. It's a lot of fun, but it takes practice. Once it was finished, we sealed the whole piece with water-based polyurethane inside and out, and then came the hardware. Now, the antique didn't have these, these chest lifts, and I think that's a good addition. This is a heavy piece to move around. For hinges, I got these pre-rusted strap hinges, and they seem appropriate. And, of course, the lid can be held open with the cover from this interior box. Now, this was a fun project to build. You could paint yours one solid color, try your own hand at decorative painting, or hire a decorative artist. Now, let me show you what we got coming up next time. It's our long-awaited Windsor chair project. We met a talented chair maker in Pennsylvania who builds these antique reproductions. And we asked him to show us how to make one of these chairs. He was kind enough to invite us to his shop and we learned a lot while we were there. Then we met his wife, who showed us how to get this finish, which makes these chairs look 200 years old. Now this is a serious project, and it's gonna take two complete episodes to build it. 
next time, part one of the Windsor Share Project, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Funding is provided by...